Philip Gary would have been a seaman, you know, a merchant seaman. So he'd been away on the boats for maybe four or five, six months. My mummy was um, a doffing mistress. She worked in the mill. My dad was a roofer. My mother was a housewife. He, he was um, a baker's labourer. He was a docker. She was very loving, a very sensitive woman. The real funny man, he, everything was for her. He, with uh, nine children. Great mother, that's what she was. <laughs> you couldn't get any better. And he had to give you change or give you money for running the shop for cigarettes or for uh, going to the bookies. Loved the kids. Loved taking the kids down to Daddy Christmas. We all loved him naturally and he, he just loved life and enjoyed life. <laughs> That time was very hard for everyone. You, you had a whole series of events, um, like the, the likes of uh, the Falls Curfew in 1970, and then the likes of internment, especially in August 1971, which, if you like, traumatised the entire community, where hundreds of people were being arrested and interned. Oh, the place is in turmoil. You get bombs going off every day of the week, shootings, and, and you know, it, it was pretty chaotic for the, for, uh, the people of Belfast at the time. I got used to what it would call, people call the troubles. Uh, I'd worked in a post office doing driving. I did a delivery where in the mornings, you know, you went up what I would call up the shankle and down the falls. Shankle Road would have been clear. Driving down the falls had been littered with burnt out cars and lorries. I remember standing on the lawn with my dad one day, looking out the window, he was two drawers, watching the boys putting the barricades up. It was all flagstones we using. And then the next thing, there was this rattle of machine gun fire. And then all of a sudden, there was nail bombs getting through. Basically, that's how I came up. It started out troubles, you know, the first of it. A couple of days before, I think, that uh, news had just broken out, you know, that. Uh, the major uh, Republicans had escaped from Cromwell Jail, and that was a lot of activity at that point in time. But this was, you know, you took this as red because it wasn't unusual for to be stopped by the army and asked and put out again a wall to be searched. Didn't like it, but you sort of had to, you know, go along with that activity. And uh, the, it wasn't unusual for the area to be, you know, see a fair number of army vehicles, even in normal circumstances, driving about the town and stuff like that, you know. So we never took a great deal of think about it, because this was, you know, you nearly accepted normality was the army's going to be here for some time. I remember uh, that morning my mother and father had been out shopping. It was coming near Christmas, so my mummy had said, what about your Christmas clothes? And I says, that mummy, sure, we'll get them next week. And she says, now you never know what will happen by next week. That's every morning. We were all up, we had our breakfast. My man and dad done their usual old thing. Uh, and then the next thing they said, they were away, they were away into the town. Because usually when around their, their usual old spots, they basically probably, they probably will end up down Sailor's Town as far as start off with, and then work their way into the town. And then they usually call in the McGurk's Town again. There was always something about that night that I'll never forget. I mean, it came to around about eight o'clock. And the place was in darkness and there was total silence. It used to be when you would have walked around a corner in the New Lodge Road or any street in the New Lodge Road, you would have walked into um, a foot patrol. 
there, there was nothing, you know, it was, the silence was deafening. It was, you heard your footsteps as you were walking down the street. In them days, there wasn't anything like Tesco's or Asda. So the shopping was done at your corner shop. So what they did every Saturday night, they would have went down to Lizzie's. They went into Lizzie's and there was a woman being served. And um, my, Lizzie apparently had said to my mommy and Danny, give me a few minutes and we'll get your stuff ready. And my mommy says, no, we'll not. We'll go on in here, sure. By the time you've got them ready, we'll have finished and we'll be back again. So my daddy says they didn't wait that night. They went on into the McGurks. And then that was it, of course. Well, I was upstairs in the bedroom um, when I heard the explosion. That really shut the house, and I mean shut the house. You might as well say that it literally shut the whole the, the uh, new lodge and all. And I can remember going, opening the window, um, and sitting on, on the bay window, and let, after the explosion went off, hadn't a clue, you know what I mean, no inclination about anything. So I went out the front door, seen people running about, running about everywhere, and then suddenly started shouting, McGurk's, McGurk's, McGurk's got it. We saw the smoke arising, so we automatically made our way down. I went down the New Lodge brick wall, and the next thing I seen was complete chaos. As I got near, it was a hill, a, a, you mean, a hill of people. It was just one complete pile of rubble with hundreds of people on top of it, trying to tear it apart to save people. And there was, they were passing out the rubble, one by one. Some, somebody shouting through a halo, anybody from the dax, anybody from the dax. And, you know, and the next thing was there was shouting, there's one here, there's, here's one, oh, there's one over here, I've got another one, and that was it. I didn't even know no more if I was on it. My Uncle Terry, he was called away by a woman coming up the street. What I didn't know at that time was the woman was telling them that they had pulled my mommy and my daddy out of the rubble. But that's my regulation of that night. And from that night, that was my life way out. watching the football highlights when the programme was interrupted and it says that uh, we interrupt this programme for a special news bulletin about the casualties of McGurk's Bar and then a list of names started appearing on the television screen and that's when my mother started screaming and that's when my father jumped up out of his seat because that was the first time we seen Philip Gary's name coming up on a television screen and that was the first time he even realised that he was dead. Her mum came up on early Sunday morning and told us the news. Uh, she, she, she could have maybe been up a bit earlier, but because she knew Margaret was expecting within a few weeks' time, a number of weeks, didn't want to do any excitement because basically we couldn't have do, done anything. He was, he was dead. I was away and uh, Bobby was murdered on... Saturday night that happened, and I didn't find out to Monday. The Brewers actually went around the hospitals and the morgues back and forth and back and forth. Nobody told them anything in the morgues, nobody told them anything in the hospitals. People in the morgue had taken a set of keys from, from the pack, packet of this dead person. And it was my, uh, it was actually my uncle Bobby, who was the Protestant, from the Protestant and uh, he left the morgue with a set of keys went back to Stanhope Drive, you know, to the house, and it was only when he put the key in the door and the door opened that they realised that the body in the morgue was actually my grandfather. It was my brother-in-law. I went and identified the body, and um, it was very hard for him too. And it was worse on the family when they were told how he was, you know. Uh, I know my, my father was born now. I know he was lying beside the gas line and he was actually born. 
uh, my mother's for our my mother's face was supposed to be badly done with the uh, the rubble. It was always sticks in my mind that I was able to identify him okay facial wise, and I don't want I'll just leave it at that. Uh, the uh, but what I'd seen in the morgue is not like you'd see on TV. Uh, it was a very dark, black room. Uh, there was uh, obviously things sitting about where there was looked to be obviously parts of bodies, not a whole like you know sitting on the floor on stretchers and stuff like that. And uh, the uh, I found that difficult. You know that uh, there was obviously th things had been recovered. Uh, it looks to be, you know, I was saying to myself, those people, like, I was lucky to a degree that I was able to identify them without any much difficulty. And uh, it always stuck in my head afterwards that uh, I'd asked the director of the funeral undertaker to do certain things. He said that would be no bother. And his coffin and one other coffin were the only coffins of the 15 people that were open, able to people to come in at a wake and come in and view. Him and one of the wee boys, you know, so the, we had that sort of, at least some really, that way we could be with him, if you understand, I mean, people had, what I call it, the remains of their family in a box, which they couldn't see, which I thought would have been very, very difficult for all their families, you know, too. Not once did, did a policeman, not once did a, a, a professional counsellor or a trained counsellor um, even come anywhere near us. The police didn't even come to the door. They haven't got the guts to come to the door. They haven't got the decency to come to the door to tell, to tell anybody where anybody was or, or what was happening to anybody. I was actually a friend of the families that identified my father, and then that's how we knew. My daddy was in a room in his own. And my uncle Jim had to tell him that my mommy was dead and I remember him crying. And that was the first time ever that I'd seen sadness or a man cry, you know. And he signed himself out because, I mean, he was very badly injured himself. He had cut some bruises and his body had been burned, you know. One of the brothers noticed that I had the wrong body. Oh. That it wasn't my father. And the simple reason why he knew that because he insisted on having my father's coffin open. And when it was open, he recognised my, my father's wee finger because my father lost his finger years and years ago in the tax. And he knows the other person's finger was fully there. So Mickey Kane's body came to our house and my father's body went to Kane's house. And you know yourself, at Belfast at that time, getting from uh, North Belfast to West Belfast, you know, it was pretty chaotic. We eventually got there, with the help of nobody else. No cops, no undertakers, no, no this, no that. Uh, I'm near sure the undertakers were involved, but I knew nothing about it. But as I say, we ended up getting the body sorted out. And that was a big knock in the face too, you know. You know that sort of thing. And the coffin came in, and my daddy says about the lid, but they wouldn't lift the lid off because my mother as you know, she was burnt alive. And just as they set the coffin down, the army came in, straight into the door, demanding that the coffin lid be lifted open because they were searching for guns and ammunition. They had went round the whole area at the night of the bombing and they had searched people's homes, the people of those that were killed. They were trying to link someone that had been killed in the bomb to the IRA in order to prove that it was the IRA that done it. And I remember my father slowly and quietly getting up from the chair. He had been sitting in the chair at the corner and he spoke to the army officer. The army officer went into the hall, went through the radio, came in again and saluted my father and turned to the army and says, we're leaving now. My daddy during the war was uh, a colour sergeant in the Royal Irish Fusiliers. So the next day then they came back with a reeve to my daddy. There was a Welsh regiment, I think the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers or something, but they would have been mostly Catholics, funny enough. And at one point they actually came to the door of the wake house um, and said how sorry they were 
to my, my grandmother and, and whatever. And um, they come in and basically paid their respects, which is something, you know what I mean, unique, something you, you, you wouldn't have seen or wouldn't have happened or wouldn't have heard of um, years later. But that was something, that was something, uh, a humanitarian gesture on behalf of some of the, the soldiers who would have been in, in the district um, at that time. They started burying them, you know, two and three, you know, two, two or three funerals in the morning, two or three in the afternoon. There was crowds, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of crowds there, like from the new lodge right up the falls road. A massive turnout. Place hasn't died. Uh, Lava Street and then down in the Lodge Old and along Larkham Street. Long Kerry Kill Millfield and walked the whole way to Milltown Cemetery, you know. There was a few, now I'm not saying all caps gave a final salute. There was two or three and I would say those two or three caps would have been old timers who knew the people that were from Sellers Town and have you know. you imagine getting towards the bottom of the shankle and there's hundreds of men, nay, not children, men and women, and they have Union Jacks and they have Ulster flags and they have all sorts of, uh, and they're screaming and they're shouting. And then the corpse was going over. The other side of religion, they were singing and dancing, which made pretty bad for my parents and all of us. There was a song in the pop charts at the time called Bits and Pieces, you know, it was a, a hit in the pop charts in 1971. Each time at any funeral went across Peter's Hill, the Lower Shankle, they got the same treatment. Men and women, and they were singing Bits and Pieces about my grandfather. Because 15 people are now dead, I could only believe come out and sing a song like that. That has stuck with me and stayed with me uh, for, for 40 years or more. You know, it's had a profound impact on, on my life then. You know. It was the, one of the, the, the biggest explosions in the loss of life in Northern Ireland at that time. I had said to myself, you know, if people seen what I seen down in the morgue, there'd be no more bombings. And always when we were walking up the Falls Road uh, behind a funeral, we'd heard a bomb go off and I just said, well, so much for that thought that I had, there'd be no more of always, you know, so. The one thing that sticks and stuck in my head ever since was the radio broadcast on the Sunday morning, on Sunday, when uh, the bulletins gave out, you know, that uh, there's a bomb explosion. It was an IRA on goal. And within 12 hours, the senior um, RUC inspectors on the scene, they had to, they had to write up a report called the duty officer's report. Um, and basically they started telling lies. They started in this report saying that um, the bomb exploded. It was brought to the bar by a known member of the provisional IRA to be collected by another known member of the provisional IRA to be taken to you know, somewhere else. And the bomb had exploded prematurely inside the bar. But where did all that come from? These stories were given out by Thiefville Barracks over in Lisburn. They were told, they were given statements out by the police and by the army and that was it. So rather than go and investigate it, they were just given what to write and that was it. Well, the very first talk was they were making the bomb in the sand. And those who were inside knew what was going on, so they were all classed as bombers. If you get a statement from the RUC headquarters, that's what the, the journalist, it was, it was lazy. Shoddy journalism, and in a way, they were colluding with the state, and just instead of instead of trying to do their own investigative journalism. The following morning, the RUC put this disinformation into black and white. 
and from our archive research, this is where the disinformation began. This is where the black propaganda emanated from. The story that was put out that it was an IRA goal, well, that was it. We were IRA, we were Republicans, we were terrorists. They caused it to themselves, they don't deserve anything. You have eyewitnesses' reports, literally from, from within ours. Um, if you go back to the RTE um, recordings at the time, there's actually a statement from a young boy who was a newspaper boy, and he actually seen the car pulling up. Um, he sees the man getting out, going over, lighting the package and running back to the car, and then the car driving off. And as it drove past him, he actually saw the Union Jack sticker on the back um, of the car. So he's given this evidence to the RTE and was then given it to, to the police. But instead of accepting that evidence, um, plus the evidence of other eyewitnesses who witnessed the, the, the actual bombing itself, instead of accepting that, the police just concentrated on this fictitious idea that it was a so-called own goal, which was a a heinous term to, to describe any, any atrocity, but I mean, that's what they kept calling it, an IRA on goal. 14 years of age, I was wondering. I, I didn't know who to believe. I, did, I didn't know what to believe, you know. Um, listening to my father and that, I mean, yes, they knew. My father was saying there was nobody in the bar. We weren't doing anything. They were sitting there. He remembers. He talked about his smell and all that there. I mean, my father was telling the truth. I'm sure a pub Paddy McGurk ran. Was it was uh, he wasn't even allowed to curse in it, and that went for everybody. You know what I mean? Um, there was no no politics. They actually are you see drunk in the pub. You know what I mean? There was a a, a, a barracks there called Glen Owl Street Barracks, and the are you see would call in and have a drink. That's the sort of pub Paddy McGurk run. McGurk's was a Christian boy, you may as well say. Paddy McGurk was uh, a real great man. Didn't allow any cursing. He called anybody cursing the square box out, <laughs> making you put money in it. Ollie McGurk, I always remember black and white television set, you know, with the thing and coming on the television saying that not only did he pray for the people who have been killed and injured, he prayed for the people that planted the bomb. And that, you know, you couldn't get any better Christianity attitude about things when, when it, he had lost his wife. His, his daughter, his business, he had been injured himself, his business had been wrecked, and he's coming out with a statement like that within a very short period after the bomb had happened. I, I just found that, you know, very uplifting that he could do that, you know. So he had three senior RUC inspectors basically fabricating the story, and that's, that was the initial lie about the bomb. And then as the day has went on, it grew legs, do you know what I mean? Brian Faulkner brought it to, when he had to go to London to explain what was happening, he then takes the lie with him um, on the Monday. And they, this isn't me talking in that sense. We now have official government documents that are stamped um, private confidential, but under the 30-year rule or the 40-year rule, in this case, we have got, the families have got access to them. So we can prove categorically that the Prime Minister of the time starts embellishing the story. And even at one point in his account, his written account, that of we have the minutes of the meeting with the British Home Secretary, he starts to say that he, as Prime Minister, has now instructed the RUC not to investigate the bombers, but to put their time and energy in the investigating the families to see if any of the Emmons have got IRA sympathies or if they got IRA connections. So he's actually interfering in the most, the biggest mass murder of people in the history of the Sixth County State.
on the 16th of December 1971, less than two weeks after the bombing, the RUC Chief Constable, during the Joint Security Committee meeting, stood in front of the Northern Ireland Prime Minister, the Minister of State for Home Affairs and the General Officer Command of the British Forces in the North at that time and told them directly that two of our family members were known IRA terrorists. This, of course, was a blatant lie and has never been substantiated in any evidence that has been presented to us by the HET or the Police Ombudsman. Within six or seven hours after that bomb gone off, you know, and they kept this up, and they spread them lies all around the world. And then the next day you have the John Taylor, who was Minister for Home Affairs. He stands up in, in, in Stormy Parliament and says basically what he was, the, the same lie that he's been fed um, previously by the RUC. And then the British Army, in their reports, you know, um, they, you call them sit reps or situation reports. We have a number of them for the, the 6th and the 14th, where they're actually expanding that, oh, the, that five of the people um, who were killed in the bar, we now know that they must have been standing around it. So they're trying to give this impression of five people standing around a bomb i.e. as if they were manufacturing it and it exploded and they were saying oh the forensic evidence now proves that uh, the bomb was inside the bar and it was being made by the people inside the bar the forensic reports weren't even made public until february 1972 so this is you know what i mean in the days after the explosion all these people start concocting these, these stories. When I heard the statement a couple of days later about young McCrory, the young uh, newspaper boy, seeing someone at the bar, and I said, now, that sounds more like what had happened. And the interview, he had done an interview with RTE very shortly, but, you know, afterwards. And when I seen the thing about the interview, you know, that I said, well, that seems more like what had happened. Uh, and it wasn't long afterwards when we were starting to get my thoughts together about how this all happened, I realised, you know, this wasn't meant for McGurk's. If this was the guys wanting to plant a bomb, the one that they'd have been wanting to hit was the jam. And the propaganda had been ready and set when the bomb went off and the propaganda would all come in, bang, 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 it was an IRA unit, etc., an IRA bomb. Even, even when he started to get the forensics and, and the forensics were starting to prove that the, the families weren't, in other words, that some of the people whose, whose bodily injuries included shrapnel, shrapnel wounds of wood. In other words, there was a door between them and the bomb and then the bomb exploded, blew the door apart and then they were getting shreds of wood. Um, as part of their injuries. And in fact, my father-in-law and a couple of others had wooden splinters in their back, which sort of proved they were, there was a wooden structure between them and the bomb. All that would have told you that the bomb was outside, do you understand? It's, that was never brought up. In fact, it was repressed when it came to the, the, the inquest. Now, what we didn't know at the time, which we subsequently found out, and I was really miffed about this point was that they had got other forensic reports as well, not only Dr. Hall's report, they had got other reports about the clothing of the, the injured and the people who were killed. And not all the forensic of their clothing showed not one of them had any sort of uh, what been near a bomb itself. We've seen the paperwork. They had that information weeks before the inquest, yet they didn't release it. They didn't mention it at the inquest, and that would have shown clearly, confirmed along with the, the forensic, you know, pathology, his report that the bomb was planted by others. Yet they didn't do that, and I couldn't take it in. That here was the people who were supposed to uphold the law, 
supposed to be looking after the law. I can understand people making mistakes and doing things, but deliberately holding information back in connection with that there, which would have cleared the whole matter at that point in time, and they didn't do that. And that still kept on and on and on, even after Robert Campbell was, was convicted. In July 1977, Robert James Campbell was arrested for terrorist activity and during uh, questioning by police, which didn't seem too heavy, I hasten to add, um, he admitted that he was in the car that had bombed McGurk's Bar in 1971. He also admitted to planning the killing of John Morrow, a Protestant worker who had been driving a, a, a van in West Belfast whenever it was attacked by his platoon. Um, Mr Morrow saved the lives of, of many people in the back who happened to be Catholics, uh, but he himself was killed. And we were told, and, and, and one of Faisley, and he was told to get himself up because he killed a person instead of a Catholic. In March 1976, the head of the CID in Belfast was given a list of five names of five UVF people who were, who were believed to be responsible for McGurk's. So a year later, when Robert James Campbell was arrested for something else, but admitted to being you know, responsible for McGurk's or being part of the team. If you go back and look at the original list, do you understand? His name is at the top of it. So if his name's true out of the five names, what do you think you should do with the other four names? Do you understand? At the very least, you would think they should be arrested and questioned. You don't have to be an expert on any of this, but you'd think you'd arrest them, put them into four separate rooms, and say, look, Campbell's squealing like a pig, and he's named Hughes. But they weren't even arrested, not even till this day. The confession that he made, they were sitting in this car waiting. They wanted to plant the bomb at the gem bar, but they couldn't, because there was men there was always somebody standing outside the gem bar. So it came to about 20, now they'd been sitting there from 8 o'clock, so it came to about, say about 25 to 20 to 8, they realised, they were told they were to deliver that bomb and they were not to come back unless it was delivered. Now, so they knew they had to get rid of it. They couldn't sit any longer because the bomb could have been sweating itself, the gel ignite. So they drove up and they turned left and the next pub they came to was McGurk's Bar that they, they, they didn't want to admit that, that McGurk's was, was, was um, an atrocity committed by loyalists because, don't forget, internment was in its infancy. The, the state was fighting the IRA, was arresting and interning Catholics, Nationalists, Republicans. So for them, it's to admit that the UVF had just murdered 15 men, women and children would have forced a rethink and would have forced the state to start arresting Protestants, in other words, UVF, UDA, um, terrorists, and putting them in jail as well. So rather than have to face that, that um, appalling vista, as someone else would have, would have says, that instead of re accepting that reality, they buried it, well, the same as they tried to bury our families, and blame them for something that they didn't do. There was a policy in place at that time entitled Arrest Policy for Protestants, which dictated Protestants and Protestant extremists were not to be interned, and they were not interned until 1973. This, this uh, stigma was still attached to our families, that they were part and parcel of a bombing thing. People were, were, were um, didn't really know, did, I mean, was it a bomb planted by loyalists? So I think there was always that suspicion that, um, especially because it was coming from government sources and, and the media and the British Army and the police and politicians. The community had a certain reservation in connection with whether, you know, uh, there was some truth to the, the 
propaganda that was going out and out. Because for some years afterwards, people, certain people would not have talked to other people because they felt that, that this was true. If they had done a proper investigation at the start, um, and they had been seen to be impartial, in other words, not being anti-Catholic, not being anti-nationalist, that you could have had a situation where a lot of people would have started to give more faith and more confidence towards the powers of the state. But instead, you felt alienated. You felt aggrieved. You felt um, pushed away. You felt um, unheard. No counselling came towards us at all. We weren't offered anything whatsoever. Nobody. The only thing we had was our friends and family and our neighbours. As my mother said, it was through prayer not that she ever was able to cope. I'm my dad. I think down the years that there was no formal structures for, for any sort of um, professional counselling or professional health. And basically they were just told to get on with it, you know what I mean, and um, make do. Oh yes, there was always a bitterness. Um, I mean, it was the deaths that they all got, but it never goes away, it never goes away, you know. And we just have to try and carry on, which is hard. I mean, it's 40 years now and still it's going on. But it was a lot of weeks afterwards, I remember getting up to use the bathroom and I heard crying. Now my granny, we lived with my granny at the time, my daddy's mummy. We always lived with her. And my daddy was crying and she was actually cradling him in her arms. Now it's all right. I mean, remember, that was her baby. You know, that was her baby. And he was saying, but it's my fault. I should have made her stay in the shop. I should have made her stay in the shop. He says, and then he says, I couldn't help them. He could this this was a man that was lying underneath a collapsed building, but he was guilty. He was guilty because she wanted to go from the shop into the pub. He was guilty because he couldn't get her out. He couldn't get he kept pushing the rubble from him, he told my granny, he kept pushing it. And I, he couldn't help Mr. and Mrs. Keenan. He was guilty. And he was guilty because he was the only one out of the four of them left alive. My father would have sat in a chair, he had the one chair that he sat on, and he had a dozed off. My daddy would have been sitting there pushing, going like this and this and doing that. And it wasn't actually until he died. He, every time he closed, he said, he was under the, he was trying to push the rubble away from him, you know. He, he closed his eyes, that was it. It all came alive to him again. <laughs> The moment the bomb exploded, our campaign for truth started. My peers, uh, the other family members, have campaigned tirelessly and relentlessly for four decades now to try and clear the name of their loved ones. They, it is a campaign they have waged with dignity uh, and constitutionally as well, it should be said. Aside from going and knocking on doors of politicians, uh, letter writing, um, going to speaking to other campaigning groups, we have had to spend most of our time uh, going through public records, through military documents, through freedom of information in order to try for ourselves to source the truth that has been left to us and our great friends in the Pat Finucan Centre and British Irish Rights Watch to do this. We're now into a, a generational thing. I mean, my grandmother has died, my mother has passed on and my elder sister, who would have been involved and, and took a, a keen interest in the campaign, she has died, so that's just our family. You replicate that across the other families. And you can actually see now at some of the meetings, the family, McGurk's family meetings, that you're now having grandchildren coming to the table. Do you know what I mean? They're sort of coming, they, they want to learn more, they want to become, what, what can we do um, to help? And it was especially noticeable there for the 40th anniversary on the 4th of December last, where young children, in other words, grandchildren and great-grandchildren of, of the McGurk's Bar um, 
um, people who were, were murdered, they came forward and they helped. You know, we had this project to recreate the bar, to put the bar, the facade of the bar back in place the way it was, and they were actively involved. So you can see it's coming down through the generations, because 40 years has taken a terrible toll physically um, and emotionally and psychologically on the families. But you're getting, you're getting inspiration by the fact that there's other ones prepared to take up the mantle and are prepared to step forward and say, well, we'll, we'll, we'll take the torch now and we'll follow, you, we'll follow it forward. I'm not an educated person, to tell you the truth, because my younger days at my mum and father were killed. I never really went to school. But I've done wee bits and pieces here and there. I've been in the built game and I know we've got a bit of built game and now I'm a lorry driver. And I've worked my way up. I've worked hard for it. I've worked on all sorts of bad wires. But with this campaign, it's opened my eyes big time of what's actually going behind doors, closed doors. The lies is actually going on. I never grieved for my mother until this last lot of years, I would be honest with you, until I really got in to the research of the McGurk's bar bombing. We now have had two reports by the historical inquiries team, and we've now had two reports by the police ombudsman's office, but the state, in the form, of, in, in this case, in the form of, of the chief constable, who wasn't even here in 1971, he can't bring himself to admit that what the RUC did in 1971 was wrong. Well, that's just another stab, it's another knife through the heart. We got the Ombudsman's report, the second Ombudsman's report, um, and basically the families felt vindicated. Here at last was, was an official government report that says that the RUC was wrong. They didn't use the word collusion, which we objected to, but they did use the term investigative bias in terms of the RUC, you know, concentrating solely on the own goal theory and not even taking into account the possibility that the loyalists may have been responsible, that that led to investigative bias on the part of the RUC. So we felt vindicated, we came out and we said that to the media, almost within two hours or, or whatever, the RUC in the form of the Chief Constable, or PSNI, sorry, in the form of, 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 of Matt Baggett, had issued three separate statements saying that, in their opinion, they weren't accepting the report. When we got the documentation from the RUC of their archives and stuff like that there, there's certain information destroyed or can't be found or no trace of, you know, disappears. But the British Army, they keep everything, you know, uh, and this is amazing because if we can actually, tr we've tracked the stuff down, but the stuff that we were looking for from particularly the RUC seems to have gone walkies, you know, not can't be found, documents, letters that we, they had written to the uh, pathologists and stuff like that there. We got the pathologist letter, the RUC letter, can't be traced. The information that connects with some of the information there, witnesses about cross telephone lines, Documentation, which is witnesses' reports, all you see, can't be traced. Strange. Or you see people who are now being asked to investigate the wrongdoings of other, or you see people, or other special branch people um, 40 years ago. And to me, that's, that's, that's nonsense. You can't have the police investigating the police. And it's the same with the Ombudsman's Office. We, at the start, had more faith in the Ombudsman's Office than we did in the HET. But now it has proven that there's even people within the, the, the Ombudsman's Office who are acting as gatekeepers, and they, they're dictating, I mean, like words like collusion can't and, and won't be used, that these people are dictating hard reports. In other words, Reports are being written by the, by the Ombudsman's office and instead of being made public are then being rewritten to suit at the agenda of the old guard.
it's indefensible. You cannot defend it. And, and for us, to blame the wrong organisation for 40 years and to cover up what they did for 40 years, it was wrong. Why is there flaws here and flaws are? What have, what have they got to hide? And a simple apology, that was all we asked for in the first place. And they wouldn't have to go through all this. Personally, I believe there was collusion um, between the state, but in other words, between the British Army, uh, particularly military intelligence, uh, and the bombers. It's hard, it has been hard to prove conclusively, but then you need to be clear um, about your definition of collusion. What, what involves collusion? I mean, is it, you know, the British Army supplying these people with weapons and explosives? No, in my opinion. But collusion, that, that, I mean, that is collusion, but collusion can also mean after the event, you know, withholding information and deliberately setting up a false narrative. In other words, giving these people an alibi, giving these people a story. That, oh no, that's basically what happened. We believe, right, there's somebody good there that has to come out to tell the truth. Somebody in there has to do it. So this is our way of going down this road and seeing if they can help us. I am more convinced now that the, the McGurk's families on their own aren't strong enough. That we need the, the active support and the active help of other families, of other campaigns, of other individuals who can all come together and say to the state, you need to, you need to resolve this issue or else we're going to end up in court for the next 20 years. You know, separate cases, separate families, taking individual court action, taking individual prosecutions, taking individual civil action. So, to find, this is, to me, this is the last unresolved issue. We solved the policing by and large. We, we solved the idea of people working together in Parliament together. But this is it. The big one that is, is hard to deal with the legacy of the past. Until we get some sort of international independent um, body to deal with this, it's still going to drag on. And those with a vested interest that the, that the truth doesn't come out are still going to dig in their heels and still going to refuse the families access to the documentation and access to, to what is required for them to, to get closure. I don't think the politicians care about the, the victims. In the old days, when people were a bit murdered by both sides, they were the first ones to jump on the bomb wagon to glorify themselves. But now, when the victims are asking for help, they don't want to know. That's across all parties. Nobody thinks about the survivors of the shootings, the survivors of the bombers, the bombings. Nobody thinks of them. I'm glad to see people sitting in powers nowadays. Where they're safe. The way things are nowadays, to me is I can't go on with my future. And a lot of people would say to me, why don't you forget about it? You know, it's gone, it's, it, it's dusted, forget about it. You know, people just want to throw it aside. But our past is our history, you know, and our past is our future. There's something, if you like, is unfinished business. You would like um, to go away and be able to do something else with your life. But there's something you just feel compelled that um, the dead cannot speak um, and we have to try and speak for them and be their voice. 
and try and act on their behalf to say that these people were innocent and that these people deserve justice? Everybody's entitled to know the truth. No matter what, Catholic, Protestant or various different nationalities have been killed in these in this troubles too, you know what I mean? Everybody's entitled to know the truth or how their loved ones was murdered and who was responsible for them. My grandmother, um, she would always say that she never wanted prosecutions. She never wanted to see people go to jail. All she wanted was someone to come and say that her, her husband, Phil Gary, uh, was innocent. He was just an ordinary Catholic who went out that night for a pint of Guinness and was killed, that he wasn't a bomber. That, that was the only thing that we wanted, was a simple apology and for our loved ones' names to be vindicated. To have their innocence put back because their innocence was taken away by an authority that was supposed to be able to protect them. They were all innocent people and just to get justice for them and clear their name, you know? That's what just people want now. I just want the truth. I'm not wanting the people to go to court and get hung and done, etc., etc. All I want is the truth to come out and admit the truth publicly. I would be happy with the truth because that's what we've been fighting for all these years, the truth. Our contention always was that the truth costs nothing. It's inquiries cost millions. Best closure for us is for the state uh, in the form of the of the police and the army and the government, they admit finally and publicly to the world that what happened um, in 1971, it wasn't our families that were, was to blame, it was the UVF. And then on top of that, it was compounded by the statements and the actions of, of, of senior RUC, um, British Army and British government ministers. The right thing society out here is just turn around and say, Right, it's time to ask what's going on here. The truth has to be told and that's it. If these people can't go on with the past, then we can't go on with our future art because the past is always going to come up no matter what. Well, I'd like people out there to come out and say, right, let's get these people together, to ask them what they need, to give them a forum to speak, to be able to tell their story so that everybody, so that the likes of the government, politicians, everybody come out and say, these people have suffered and they are still suffering. We need to get the truth out to these people. We need to make sure that this never happens again in this society. Mm.